staff writer at The Hollywood Reporter, and um, thank you. Uh, and this is Peter Hedges. Peter, can I thank you for coming out tonight. I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you, too. Thank you uh, for doing this. It's an honor to sit next to you, and um, can I embarrass you for a second? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So Peter Hedges is a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, producer, and director. He directed, wrote, directed, and produced Ben is Back, which you just watched. In 2003, he made his directorial debut with Pieces of April. His other work includes Dan in Real Life, The Odd Life of Timothy Green, the books What's Eating Gilbert Grape, which he adapted for the screen. Yes, uh, lots of fans of that. And was nominated for an Oscar, uh, or sorry, which he adapted Gilbert Grape for the screen. He wrote the books The Heights, and an ocean in Iowa. He was nominated for an Oscar for co-writing about a boy. And um, this is his latest. And uh, I was in Toronto for the world premiere of Ben is Back, and Julia Roberts said from the stage that um, that if you don't cry during, if you're not crying, then, then there's a reason to be alarmed. Um, <laughs> because Peter Hedges cries a lot. So I feel like if you don't cry, I will have not have done my job. Um, but I wanted to start here. You know, Ben is back. It is fiction, um, but it's deeply personal for you. Can you talk to me about your mother and how she influenced and inspired? <laughs> He's going through the tears. Uh, yes, uh, I grew up in a, a family that was ravaged by alcoholism. And, uh, my mother uh, walked out of the door of our house when I was seven. I, I didn't know her sober until uh, she was until I was fifteen. Three attempts at rehab um, and, and near death, she the third time stuck. And uh, for the last 22 and a half years of her life, she devoted her life to helping other people get well. Uh, and so, all of and I, and I write a lot about mothers, and I write uh, a tremendous amount about family, and um, I think she was a large. But what, I, uh, what happened in a more recently was that uh, someone I knew overdosed and died, an actor, my favorite actor ever overdosed and died, and a relative nearly died. And I wanted to write about um, this epidemic. I just didn't know what story to tell. So I began a period of research that went for a number of years. And I just talked with a bunch of people, and I read every article, and tremendous amount of research and it, it took a while until it hit, I hit upon this idea. It, it became so big and so unmanageable and so unaddressable for me. But I, I did find if I just, once I decided to write about one family over the course of one day, I, I, it felt like that was something I could do and that I could <coughs> with the help of the people, the many people who helped make this film, um, we could put a story into the world that would be a part of the 24 hours a day is, is even more profound for you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and why you decided to do this one family on this one day? Um, because I know that you've, you, you learned a lot through your research about how it, people seem to be doing so well sure. in just one day. Yeah, the, the thing say. that I kept hitting upon and, and what's happening is that uh, there's just been a tremendous amount of shame for many years. It was early. The, when AA started, they started AA as a, an anonymous fellowship because if you, if people knew you were suffering from the disease of alcoholism, you, you could, I mean, your lots could go wrong for you, and 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 anonymity has been very key. But and one of the reasons, one of the, the great things that happened through that movement is that. Uh, the veil of shame started to be lifted um, over time. But that isn't happening at the moment with the heroin opioid epidemic. There's just a tremendous amount of shame. But what is starting to happen, because you know 70,000 people are gonna overdose and die in America this year, and it's an astonishing number of people, and it will be a larger number next year. But what's happening is they're uh, in obituary after obituary, people are now saying, why 
their relative uh, or their loved one died. Um, and what struck me in so many of the obituaries, I started collecting them, and it sounds morbid, but I, I, they were I just, so many stories I, I just kept finding. The number of times that somebody had two months or six years or 20 years, and then they had slipped or they, they in a moment, and, and sometimes nobody could even see it coming, there, this moment would occur where they would, their loved one would go upstairs and, and not come down. And, um, and so I wanted to write from a place of someone who had some recovery, who had some hope. Um, and, and, but not, not enough really that you could even, the, the family can relax. So that was kind of the thinking. I hope I answered it. Yeah, you did. Okay. You did great. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, Woo! <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, you have proven your skill in writing mothers, which you uh, mentioned, and you've never written a mother like this. Um, no, no, no. And, and, and I, I, uh, I wanted to write a love story about a hard thing. And I was um, very interested in, um, while I don't want to make Holly too noble because I think she makes many mistakes, the one mistake she doesn't make though, is she doesn't give up. And uh, it's tough because in every dynamic, sometimes you have to be really hard and tough and sometimes the loving thing is, doesn't feel loving. Sometimes the thing that feels loving is actually enabling. So there's all we can spend hours and hours talking about it. But um, when I started to write this, it was going to be the story of a sister and a brother. And I was writing it, and I and I happened to have a remarkable sister who would go into the underworld to bring me back if I got lost. Um, but that felt. Maybe there was a, a, even a greater love to explore. And while I'm a father and I love my kids and I believe fathers do love their children, I think when a mother, well, you know, um, Whitman, Whitman, I just love to say this, Walt Whitman, my good friend, um, <laughs> but he, when he wrote about the Civil War, because he was really such a great articulator of what was occurring, when he described soldiers dying on the field after they've been wounded, they never called out, ever called out for their girlfriend, or their wife, or their father. Every time, it seemed, in my reading anyway, they were always calling out for mama or mother. And um, so maybe, maybe this is my great fantasy, that my mother would come rescue me, breathe life into me, the end, maybe. I wasn't conscious of that. I just knew that Orpheus was my favorite love story, and I wanted it to be uh, one family member going into the underworld to bring the other family member back. And and once once I made the choice for it to be a mother and a son, uh, the uh, the script just it didn't write itself, but it started writing me, and it was a very joyous process writing this very hard thing. Thank you for that. Uh, there's so much to talk about in, in that because I uh, switched it to a mother and a son. You have a son. He's in the movie. Mm. Uh, he, yes. did not, he did not want to do it. But first, before we get to that, I, I wanted to see if we could start with um, Julia Roberts because this role just seems to be calling out for her. Um, so how, what was the process like in getting her for this? Well, uh, it, what, the process was that um, we we sent the script to her agents, um, and they liked it <laughs> <laughs> a lot for her. And uh, then I wrote her a letter. I'd met her twice. I'd seen her once. I saw her. I've never told this story publicly. I went. There was a famous uh, restaurant in New York called Columbus, and it was where all the cool people went, and I was very poor and struggling, but I knew a, a manager of actors, and he managed Eric Roberts, and we went to this restaurant, and uh, 
someone came up and said, look, I'm working with Eric's little sister to the manager. Would you like to meet her? And I had been looking across this restaurant at this beautiful young woman. I mean, she must have been 18. I was probably 23 or 24. And I kept thinking, who is that beautiful girl? I'd so like to meet her. And came up to this manager, and I, mean, I don't want to meet don't want to meet her, because of course, <laughs> it was Julia Roberts. I'm like, ah, come on. She wasn't Julia Roberts yet. She was just Julia Roberts. But then she became Julia Roberts. Anyway. So, so I wrote a letter, and uh, I, then I heard that she read the script and very much responded to it, and that she could talk to me in a couple of weeks. But I knew that I wanted to make the movie this past winter, and I said, and this was out of character for me, I said, um, I don't know where she is in the world. I will go there, but I need to speak to her in the next two days. And they came back and said, well, she happens to be going to be tomorrow in Malibu, and so I, I think about 12 hours after I said that hubristic statement of, oh, I have to see her, I, I was sitting before her um, in Malibu, and we had an, a wonderful conversation. I came armed with a list of actors that I thought would be great to play Ben. Um, Lucas was not on that list, and um, these were actors who had either read the script or their agents read the script, and they're rather prominent young actors and very good, and they'd be very good in, in the part. But I wanted to be prepared for that question because that's going to be important for her if she does do, decide to do the movie. She never wanted to look at the list. She said, Lucas needs to play this part. I said, well, first of all, he's not available, and at that moment he wasn't. And also, he doesn't really want to make a film with his dad. And it's not that he doesn't like me. It's just he wants me to be his dad and not be, um, I think one of the great joys of being 20 or 21 is you're either away at college or you are, in his case, working and doing, getting to do what you love. And it's kind of wonderful to leave home and to not feel home right there with you. Um, but Julia, uh, I think her interest in him doing the film, and then he started to hear from his friends all those young actors are friends, and they're so supportive of each other. It's really neat that uh, your dad wrote a really good script, and he, he read it. And um, and he really gave me a great gift, um, because he didn't need to do this film. He had just filmed Boy Erased, and he had every right. He deserved a vacation. But um, he knew that this was a very personal story for me, and it, he liked the role very much, and he loved the idea of working with Julia. And, and he gave me a great gift by doing this film because I never thought he would do it. But the minute Julia said he, he needs to do it, <clears throat> then I became possessed in my mind. I was in my heart. I was like, yes, Julia's right. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I don't, I, it's been so wonderful to watch him make his choices and, and, and carve his own way in this strange world of film. And and I just I didn't I I didn't want to put any pressure on him. The movie was going to happen. Um, he just decided to bring his incredible talent and merge it with Julia's, and they have such a great chemistry. I mean, I, I really think. And and I mean, I can't tell you what a joy it is. I, I wish I could say that was my directing. It was it was casting, but it was their generosity. Some some actors who are of note, um, the great actors are generous, in my opinion. But many actors that we love are not generous. They act alone. But Julie and Lucas didn't act alone. They played off each other. And every scene that you see in this film, particularly the, if you take the 12 or 15 big dramatic scenes, I could have cut and shown you six or seven different versions of each scene. Very different, quite amazing. And one of the things I really feel about film, um, certainly my films, that if you see a film of mine and there's a performance that doesn't ring true, it's my fault. It really is. Because they brought it. And if there's a moment that felt skipped or jumped, me, 
me mostly, maybe the, my editor Ian, but it's on us. Yeah. No, it really is. And and if they're great, they you give them all the credit because it there was an inevitability about what they did along with Courtney and, and uh, Catherine and everyone else. Sorry, I'm talking too much. No, this is that's how this should go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> can we talk about one of those scenes where they sort of sure head to head? Um, yeah. I know you said you know it feels like the movie takes a turn when they return from the yes. Christmas Eve service, but. It, but it actually, to me, feels like the scene in the dressing room is where it switches, and that scene, I know you said, is like a microcosm for the film as a whole. Can yes. you talk about that particular scene? What sure. Scene represents for the film? Chris is referring to the dressing room scene. Do you remember it? Uh, no, I mean, might be thinking about Green Book, which is apparently an amazing film. Um, what am I saying? That, that scene, uh, yeah, for me, the movie starts really shift when they go to the mall because prior to that, they've been they've been in the hi Carol. That's my first great girlfriend right there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I just saw you. That's awesome. Wow, um, that's nice. Um, Carol, we're gonna have questions for you. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, okay, that that scene. Um, you know, you know, Ben is just. Encounter. He's gone to a meeting. Um, who is he calling on the phone? I mean, there are all sorts of questions. Uh, he sees Spider in the mall. That triggers something for him. He says, I need to get to a meeting. And then, of course, uh, the young, I don't know, Kara Kay is her name. We didn't say her name in the film, but Alexander Park, an amazing actress, plays the girl who says, you were my dealer. And, and so that scene starts, and you see in Ben this, you know, one of the things I deprive Lucas of, or whoever the actor was to play Ben, because he's clean at the beginning of the film, the only time he uses drugs in the film is at the end when he's unconscious. So that kind of delicious acting opportunity that I think one would really like. You don't get another young actor, David Zellweger, the Spider got to. That's why I created Spider, because I wanted you as an audience to, to experience as someone who was dope sick, because it, it really informs why people spin out and why they give up their babies and why they do all sorts of horrible things because they're dope sick and they're not getting high. They're basically in so much physical agony from the withdrawal, which was something I did not, I thought I knew a lot. I didn't know that until I started researching it. But they don't get high anymore. They're just trying not to feel sick. So anyway, um, that scene, um, for me, why I why I love the scene is that that you see you don't know. I, I when Lucas started making choices in that mirror, I, I, he was just he became an animal and a creature, and I, I kind of saw what he must be like when he's using or when he's about to use that that like he'd become a different being in that moment. And Holly, of course, is oblivious and and. Um, uh, you know, she's just on her task of getting him dressed. But we're seeing, we're seeing the side of Ben. Of course, she gets, I mean, I'm just recounting the scene, though. Um, but for me, what I loved about it was uh, in any scene where the, 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 the characters go from A to Z and back to B and then down to Y, uh, that's pretty thrilling. And, and so he, he is this, He's definitely, his mouth is watering. He's wanting to use. He goes in. One of the questions in our conversation when Lucas and I were trying to figure out whether this was a good idea, uh, uh, we, we met, and he had this question about why Ben says you didn't check my shoes. It was a, one of his big questions. What was that? And I had a much a simpler idea, but in talking with him for the hour we talked about this moment, said, I think there's a part of Ben that really wants to be honest. And I think it's one of those moments that blurts out. And he, yeah, I loved how he did it. But, but that conversation led to the notion of, oh, we could also go into the dressing room and shoot Ben's point of view. And I hadn't written that. I rewrote the scene to include those shots. Um, but, but what you see is you see Holly, you see her hope you see her buoyancy, and then of course the minute the door, he closes the door, and we move the 
we added the click of the lock because we didn't have that and the dressing room didn't have a lock so we made the sound but even by dropping it in where we do editorially and, and, you, and when you see that change in Julia's and Holly's face it was so thrilling um, and, and that scene was shot with just a, basically three masters the master is a shot where uh, the camera played all the way up until Ben closed the door and then we were on Holly until she started pounding on him and then we had a, the third shot was when we followed her out the scene, that last part of the scene was supposed to be shot outside but there had been a blizzard and uh, normally get 12 hours to shoot in a day we shot that entire scene in 5 hours uh, because we needed to get the crew out because another blizzard was coming and they, anyway there were a lot of things that make that scene so special for me but what I really love about it is that you see you see Ben's deception. You see that there's a the biggest moment of affection in the film, which was something that Lucas and Julia found together when he kind of ducks his head and hugs her. Um, I so loved. I was very angry that day because we 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 didn't build a set of the dressing room, so we couldn't quote pull the wall. So. I was very limited in how we could shoot the scene, and I thought if I'd had more foresight, I would have insisted on that. And I went to Julia and I said, I'm really sorry. I can't come around and really shoot you. It's, gonna, it's not gonna work. And, and she found a way, and she's such a pro, that beautiful moment when he says, this is embarrassing, so that we're really on Lucas, and she's digging in the pockets, and, and then she just, if you ever see the scene again, or actually the New York Times has a, they, you can go home and watch the scene again and hear me talk about it. But I don't talk about this. Julia found a way to just turn and say, no, this is love. She's almost kissing it. I mean, it's not sexual, but there's that much intimacy in it, which I loved. And then, and then that second half was supposed to happen outside, but we couldn't because of the blizzard and it was cold and, and, and we'd have to move to a different location and there wasn't time. So we reinvented the scene, so it all happened. And then as we were doing it, I said, would you ever consider just saying, what the fuck are you looking at? Who the, and she said, oh yeah, I'll do that. And, <laughs> and there are eight takes of the shot, of that third master shot, and each one she gave a different phrase. Like she never did the same phrase. And I, I would love to just have them all eight in a row, just <laughs> so you could just play them on a loop something about Julia Roberts' fierce mama bear just saying, you know, totally going after Lucas. Also, the scene ended up playing much more violent than I thought it would and they thought it would, but we did a rehearsal. We did a rehearsal. I said, we're just going at this point, but they kept going, and I thought, okay, let's see what they do, and the minute they started going at each other in that dressing room, and because we couldn't pull out the so sometimes that what happens in a film is the best thing can happen is the thing that you think, oh, this is going to completely restrict us. So I've come to really love limitations. So we, we needed to shoot that scene in six hours because we needed to get our crew home. And that forced me to think in a simpler way about how to do the scene. But then we found a way to do it where I, it really allowed those two actors to go at it. And that to me is what the film is. It's this push pull love story between a mother and son. I don't love limitations, but we're gonna have to sort of wrap this up quickly and open it up to questions from the audience. But can I selfishly just ask you one question as a 30 second answer? Sure, um, oh, can you tell me you a 30 second and answer? I'm proud. proud. <laughs> While you guys think about uh, your questions is, is just tell me about the last scene um, and how many takes you did and, and what. Sure, was. I did four takes. Um, uh, I only needed to do two, um, live mostly in the second take, but um, I, I asked for a third take uh, because I just felt like I maybe wanted some variety. Uh, and then I realized that uh, we had a second camera which was shooting on Lucas and it was shooting wide. And so I asked for a fourth take because I wanted to pop the lens on his camera so that we could be really close on him. And I'm so glad we did that fourth take, which we actually do use. Um, 
it's a combination of the fourth take, the, the fourth take of, of everything on Lucas, those two shots on Lucas are the fourth take, and the beginning of the take, um, because she did a really nice thing with yanking off the, the, the belt. Um, but we mainly live in take two. Uh, I mean, the, the truth about Julia Roberts is that her first takes are astonishing. They're staggering, almost always. Um, Lucas, too, reached a point where you know, they, they were bringing it right away. Um, but sometimes in a film like this, you want to play a bit because you, I, I just wanted a little editorial room. So, and sometimes I just like watching them do the scene, so I just kept asking them <laughs> over and over again. Say, I but, but that one, we, we did four takes, but, but we would have been fine with two, but swap the lens so we get the close up. That's a great staggering scene, and uh, uh, that's what you can do when you're the director. Questions from the audience, yes. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my question is as to why it's sort of set around the holidays. And sure. There was a specific scene where Ivy sings Oh Holy Night that I thought was kind of a really powerful scene where, you know, he's kind of crying and right. And I wonder if there's any specific significance to that scene. Sure. Uh, the question is why you set it around the holiday. Um, one of the things I needed for the engine of the plot was why would Holly want him to stay home? And I thought, well, it could be for, a, a, you know, a, maybe someone in the family is winning an award, or Ivy's graduated from high school. Could be one of those events. But uh, Christmas, uh, for me, is just it's a big deal, um, and it's for many people. It's a time when we're supposed to be happy. But it also felt like that might be something she would wish for. And she says at one point, you know, I, I, I shouldn't have said I wanted him home. And she's taking responsibility for the fact that he came home. So <clears throat> there was that thought. I also had made a film called Pieces of April, which is set around Thanksgiving. It's not as if I'm gonna go through all the holidays now. But, but I, had, I, I did want to get back to making that kind of raw, real, elemental kind of filmmaking. It's just been a personal ache of mine to make another film in that spirit. Handheld, feels very real, like you're peering, peeking in on life. So there was that. I'm the son of an Episcopal priest, so I'm a sucker for church scenes. Um, uh, it had been mentioned to me that maybe I shouldn't start the movie in the church, if, um, and uh, but I wanted to, but what I ended up, the, the, the wrinkle I added was by having Holly say to the kids, do you guys really want to be coming to church every week? Yeah. And so there was something kind of great about a, someone who's got her kids in the pageant and they come to church for the holidays, but very few kids, in my experience, just are like, can't wait to get to church. <laughs> so so that I, you know, anytime you get somebody in your life who kind of raises those questions, they end up helping you. I hope I answered your yeah. question. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to do uh, fast answers. Why yeah, in this I'm so impressed. Stripes. Yeah. Stripes. How often do dogs get injured? Ponds. Oh, okay. True story. We um, we have two young men as our sons, um, but uh, we went once to. Uh, but they're allergic, highly allergic. One son in particular, and we went um, when they were young to a place where there were many dogs. And there was this completely wild-looking dog named Ponce. And um, I don't think Ponce was the dog that maybe was in my son's lap, but there was a point where, he, as he was just petting this dog, he just started breaking out all over his neck and his face, and tears filled in his eyes, because he knew, and we knew, he couldn't have a dog. We later got two dogs that were just, they're not allergic to, or not allergic enough. They're slightly allergic to, but not enough <laughs> that we can't deny them the dogs. So, but we just, I just love the name Ponce as a dog. Great question. Never had that question. Great. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, top it. Somebody top that question. Stripes is in the lead. So you did very well. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, 
for sure. That's a great question. Great. Great. To uh, Peter over to writer's block to write the screenplay. So if there's any writers in the room, we can sure. Do uh, yeah, I mean that that I'm happy to talk about that too. I um. One of the frustrating parts about people who suffer from alcohol or heroin or prescription pills is the cyclical nature of it. And uh, I get very angry at those in my life. And um, I think it, it helped me to not fall. I, I, I didn't want to write that cycle over and over and over. I just wanted that cycle once. So so one of the ways I avoided that was by the narrowing of the time frame. Also starting Dan where he was. Uh, the second half of the film, um, I, I don't write films that are this intense, that where every from the very beginning you're nervous and on edge. So I was anxious about that. I'm anxious whenever I come not in my sweet spot. Uh, so I was nervous about that. Um, mainly I was nervous about not, you know, every family or every person who deals with this has a different story, but I wanted it to ring as true as possible. Uh, also, there's some concern when you cast one of the great, I, I think our greatest movie star, and one of the great movie stars in the history of movie stars. But that became not such a problem when she showed up and there's no vanity, there was just a ferocity and a fragility and a willingness to go anywhere and go everywhere for this part and also as the character. But I think, um, you know, movie like this, uh, something's out of place, something's a little off and it can all unravel. So um, I just, I leaned on a lot of people, I leaned on experts, I talked to a lot of people, I had uh, friends of mine who've suffered from heroin um, or other drugs have, you know, read the script and, and pushed me. Um, Holly was easy for me to write, Ben was harder. I can write Holly in my sleep. I'm, I'm Holly on some level, much more Holly than I'm Ben. Um, I believed Ben in my first draft, I believed everything all of my friends who know more about this world than me said, no, he's, he, may whip, he may be saying what he'd like to be true, but he's lying a lot. And so, anyway, I hope I answered that. Okay. Um, one more question. I'm sorry. So make it good. You're competing with stripes. Let's go for you. <laughs> no. Um, great question. Uh, I write at home. I used, I mean, for many years I had an, an apartment in a studio apartment nearby where I wrote, but then the kids moved out and we have a house. And well, why am I going to an office when there's my wife and the dogs? They're very interesting. And so I go home. Uh, this process was, um, I, you, you re referenced this. I, I had hit a spot where I lost confidence. Every project I was doing was taking twice as long. I was starting over. Uh, I wasn't writing to a level that was satisfactory to me. And, um, and so I went into intense therapy, uh, a traditional therapist who you know, always had a pad ready to prescribe something. Um, and, and I'm not a person who takes anything, so that was a big deal for me to even contemplate that. And then I also worked with a cognitive therapist to try to develop some strategy to, did I have ADHD, was I depressed, had I, what, what, what was it? This may be too personal, but it, I don't wanna be honest. So what happened was um, one day I was in my, working with my traditional therapist and uh, we had 10 minutes left and I mentioned something about my, my ideas file or the, the in-law on my computer. I have a whole bunch of ideas that are <coughs> in files, you know. She said, what, what, what's that? I said, oh, I have this, I just have a, some ideas that, you know, I, I've started half formed, half finished. She said, well, tell me about that. And I started, 
I had this story, I got this story about this, and I did another one, I did another one, and I, I went, and I just kept talking, the way I, as you can see, I do, but I was just going and going and going, and I, I looked up, and she had um, tears in her eyes, and she's not a person who I even, even knew if she cried. I mean, she's just <laughs> very tough and smart and good. And um, she said, oh, oh, no, 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 you're, you're not depressed. stories you're supposed to tell. And after the election, however you feel politically, um, I find this to be just an unbearable, untenable time. We're so polarized. My relatives and I don't agree politically. I don't, I can't sometimes even call them on the phone. I'm so upset. And, uh, and I'm sure they're confused by what I feel. But the truth seems to be co-opted. Everything is shaky, nothing is grabbable. And I felt that one thing I could do creatively was try to become the most honest and the most authentic in my work. What if, what if that was one of my responses to this untenable moment? Was I just committed to being making the boldest work I could? So what I did is I carved out a window of time. I, apparently this is not a great verb, but I, it's my favorite verb. I gifted myself six weeks. I had about 10 pages. Prior to that, I had signed up for a writing workshop with uh, a former student of mine who had a writing workshop, and I, I signed up, and I went to study with my student. <laughs> and I wrote three pages over three weeks each three weeks. I had nine pages then and back. And then I gifted myself those six weeks. And in five weeks and five days, I wrote a draft. But what helped me was I went back to my roots, which was that I would write. And we had some young actors, some of Lucas's friends, who were living in our home over the summer because they were on break from drama school. And then there were actors in my neighborhood that I would call up and say, can you come over at four? And I call them at noon. And I had fresh pages to read. And about every five or six days, I'd read a bunch of pages, and I was getting more and more confidence, and I'd get a rough draft of 75 pages, and a week later I had 85 pages, and a week after that I had 95 pages. And then five weeks and five days, on the 4th of July, two days before my birthday, I had a draft, and then I did two small rewrites <coughs> of that. But, but I did years of research, and I've been wanting so much to write in response to all that untenable loss that I mentioned earlier. But, but I also felt empowered because she'd said, you aren't telling the stories you're supposed to tell. So I looked at all of the stories I wanted to tell, and I thought, which one might be the most, cost me the most to write, but also I, I feel the most purpose in my, in my attack or my, or my attempt, but also what might be of the most use. And, and all those kind of married together, and then this, this window of time that I, I wasn't desperate in it. It became very joyous. It was it was the happiest I've ever been as a writer, ever. And um, and it's led to just a, a period of rebirth. Um, one of my other teachers, a really brilliant writer. Uh, both of these teachers were brilliant, but the previous teacher that I signed up for a year before, I took a class at the Y. This writer, I came to the movie the other night, and um, her name's Annie Baker. She won a Pulitzer Prize for the flick. She's brilliant and, and young enough to be my daughter, uh, but brilliant. And I told her about this hard time I've had. She said, you know, we don't, we don't appreciate hard times enough. She said it better than this, but, but we need these times. These are the times where we find out who we are. And um, with a lot of help, a lot of love from my family, and a lot of support from my friends, um, and some professionals giving me some, some, you know, some tools, um, I got, found my way back, at least momentarily, to, to uh, passion, <coughs> connection to the stories I need to tell. And I, I'm so appreciate your coming out tonight and, and listening to me, and, and thank you, Chris, and for your support for the film. So meaningful, and um, 